but need to check and understand your new algorithm. Another thing that was confusing maybe was about what needs to be known about last lecture because there is so much technicality that is not important in my opinion. I mean, it's important because I like it, but it's not very important to know for the final. So, let me try to gather my thoughts about it and then I'll send a, a general email about those two points. And then if, it, if there's anything that is unclear, just don't be shy, just ask me to uh, clarify anything and I'll be happy to do that. Because I understand that sometimes it's really confusing to know what you're supposed to study or not. Especially in a lecture like last time where there was a lot of you know, nitty gritty about how to do things. But the point was just to expose you to this more so than for it to to count into the future. Are there any questions either about that or about anything else? As always, crystal clear. Today's lecture is not uh, very long and it is uh, decisively decisively simple. It looks really simple, but uh, it's actually incredibly complicated. Uh, and I will try to make it as simple as possible. The issue of species and speciation was really important uh, at the time of Darwin and Wallace. And then sort of lost uh, interest for a long time. And later, uh, became a little bit more interesting, then lost a lot of interest for like 20, 30 years. And all of a sudden now, it becomes really important. Mm -hmm. It's uh, really important for two main reasons right now. The first reason is because, because we have genomic tools, we actually can address some questions that were asked a long time ago and were left open and were not uh, resolvable and now instead with uh, full genomes we can uh, address them so that's kind of interesting to revisit old questions with modern tools and another thing that is uh, maybe more uh, important is that understanding speciation has something to do with conservation biology because loss of biodiversity <coughs> is also a loss of uh, speciation. And what I mean by that is that the way you people look at conservation, I'm just going to have a one minute rant about conservation biology in general, is that in general, the way people look at conservation is very biased by the way the laws work in their country. In the United States, it's very easy to have a law that protects a single species that is uh, charismatic for whatever reason. So you have spotted owls and um, I don't know, mountain lions, whatever that is, uh, desert tortoise. So having laws that protect those species is, uh, is uh, shaping the way we look at conservation. So when we talk about loss of biodiversity, we in the United States tend to think about railways and spotted owls. In other places, uh, people talk about entire ecosystems and they say, well, you know, rainforests are in danger or whatever. And this is important because speciation addresses regions more so than species, strangely enough. There are areas that are really important for speciation to happen. And, you know, if you look one or two species, it's not very important in the big picture. And it's very important, of course, but it's not nearly as important as uh, losing an area that is going to generate 200,000 species. So it's very, very good. So that's, for those two reasons, I think, uh, the, the field of speciation has uh, sort of uh, a renewed interest. When I started my work, very few people work on speciation. Now, any issue on evolution or molecular ecology or these things, there's always stuff like speciation. So, today's lecture is in two parts. One is, before we talk about speciation, which is the creation of new species, 
we need to talk about what a species is in the first place. This is what is called species concept. Species concept means how do you define a species? And then once we all are on the same page as far as how to define a species, then I can go on and describe how species are created in the first place. So first part, let's talk about species concepts. And species concepts, the sort of uh, poster child of species concept is this person that is here. His name was Ernst Meyer. He was a very uh, interesting person, extremely opinionated, brilliantly smart, of course. And uh, he did a lot of work on birds in uh, Papua New Guinea. And uh, he died when he was, I don't know if he was 100 or 101. He was in one, he's in 101st year. And he published papers and books all the way to a few days before he died. So he published a lot and he was quite insightful. Just as an aside, he was not at all supposed to work in this field. He was waiting in an island somewhere in the Pacific. He had applied for a job and uh, he got that job, but uh, he did not receive the letter arrived very late. And as he was waiting, they offered him a position as a naturalist on the trip to Papua New Guinea. He went, discovered the birds of paradise, and then that's why he decided to do that. So it's kind of interesting that a small event really changed the fate of his uh, career as well as the species concept idea. Anyway, he was kind of an interesting person. Read some, thing, some, some stuff that Prince Myers time was spent. Before we go into species concepts, the reason why species concepts are important is because once you define what a species is, then you can define how many there are and what to protect, if protection is something that you're interested in. But even before going there, there are two big camps in science or in life maybe. It's like the cage, you know, I trust only two people. One is me and the other one is not you. So that's the same idea. So the first one is, are species real? So the two camps are, some people claim that everything is human made. I mean, in the big picture, I assume that they're probably right. That is, humans really feel uncomfortable not uh, knowing what's going on, and so to comfort themselves, they like to pigeonhole things and, and put labels on things. So these people claim that species are not real, and they are just an easy way for us to understand the chaos that is around us. Other people, and I am among them, so I'm very biased in the way I'm presenting things, but I just want to make sure that you understand that I'm very biased because I'm strongly in the other hand. Think that species are real, and there is a biological reason, or there are biological entities. There is a number of arguments in favor of that, of course, because it's what I discuss. I'm going to uh, describe what I think is right. And one of them is was described uh, quite uh, uh, nicely by uh, Jerry Diamond. I don't know if you've read uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. I think it's called the book. They forced my kids to read this book when they were like 13 years old and they were just rolling their eyes. But the book is all right, I suppose. But, so Jerry Diamond also works on uh, Birds of Paradise in PNG, Papua New Guinea. And he brought with him a team of scientists to identify bird species and using a number of genetic and morphological and behavioral tools came up with a list of species. Then he also talked to the local uh, people that have a language that is relatively limited as far as number of words but more than half of their words are actually names of birds, which is because they are very important to their diet. And um, the names 
the scientific names that Jared Diamond came up with, with his scientific team, matched exactly the names of the other people. They would say, okay, this is a species, and the other guy says, yeah, that's what it is. And they would have a name for every single one of them. So he thought that the fact that two completely different approaches, hunter-gatherers and scientists, coming up with the same sort of uh, uh, entities, was a strong argument in favor of the real existence of species. When I first read it, I said, this is kind of stupid. And then I thought about it, I said, well, actually, it's quite profound. I like it. There is another thing. I, I, don't, I hope that, like me, just don't trust any of what you guys hear. Just make up your own mind doing your own things. So I said, well, is it really true or not? So this is just one example of the kind of stuff I do. And this is what convinces me that species are real, so each person finds things differently. This is, I don't even remember what this is, actually I may have downloaded it from the web or something. But this is a phylogenetic tree of three species of whatever, it doesn't matter. Each one of these names is an individual. And so, and this is what I find 99.9% .9 of the times I make phylogenetic trees with species that I work with. And I do that for a living, so I have hundreds of those things. And they always look something like this. What I mean by that is that within what I would call a species, I find that organisms tend to be very close to each other, and between them there is a large distance. And so this makes me think that if species were not real, I would have a slow gradation between one and the other, and I would have some individuals that could fall in between these things, and I never see that. I always see stuff that looks a little bit like this, where I have, you know, without knowing anything, I don't even know which species this is, it doesn't matter. I would say, okay, that's pretty easy to see that there are three groups. And so that somewhat convinces me that species are real. Again, uh, that's my personal experience, so I have to say that. If you agree that species exist, you may wonder how many species are currently uh, in place. There are about 3 million species that have been described, and only one and a half in some sort of detail. And there are anywhere between 5 and 100 million species on the planet. Uh, that is kind of a big range of unknown. And it might be a lot more than that. It could be an order of magnitude more. Easy. So why is it uncertain? Well, there are two things that contribute to that. One is that a number of groups are poorly studied. In some respect, parasites, since pretty much everything that exists has parasites, so you just can count whatever species there are and you multiply that by at least two. And then another thing is microorganisms which we have really no idea. I mean, one order or two, three orders of magnitude in unknown of microorganism would be completely reasonable. We really have no idea what's going on. And sometimes, I mean, I think, I, I'm not very much into microorganisms, but I, I always wonder what the hell we're doing. You know, we're traveling around the world with airplanes and stuff. We are probably mixing up a whole bunch of species with our shoes and everything else. We must mess up everything, but we have no idea. We are doing things and we have no idea what we're doing. We are vessels, right? We are just carrying microorganisms around. And uh, the second thing is that environments are poorly studied. As an example, in the tropics in particular, where biodiversity is quite high, I'm talking about macro-biodiversity, I'm not talking about microorganisms, which we don't know exactly how it works. Rainforests, coral reefs, that's a classic example, kelp forests, these kind of things have probably a ton of organisms and they are very poorly studied because it's just not easy to get there. Thankfully, we are destroying them really fast, so the work is getting a little easier, but uh, nevertheless. One hectare of tropical rainforests, 475 species of trees, 25,000 species of insects. Each tree that is being cut down in the Amazon is probably harboring an endemic species of insect. Uh, each individual tree. 
Uh, one anchor of coral reef has less species, nevertheless, quite a number of them. In the big picture, if you, uh, if you like to think in, uh, in very, very large uh, time scales, which some people are really good at, one of the things that uh, is really interesting was proposed by two professors at, uh, at uh, UC Davis, Gary Verme and uh, Rick Rosberg, and they talked about the leaf density hypothesis. This is a big idea. The idea is that in the old days, there were more species of organisms in the ocean than on land. But what happened is that at some, part, at some point in the fossil records, the leaves of, uh, of land plants start to get a lot more veins. Right now, when you look at the leaf, you know there are all those veins. In the old days, 350 million years ago, there were a lot less of them. And then there were mutations that changed that and vascularized the plants a lot more. By doing that, they were able to absorb a lot more energy and produce a lot more uh, carbon. And this very rapidly increased the metabolism and the turnover on land. And plants started, started to expand a little bit, but that started expanding insects. Insects started being specialized pollinators, and that's what increase the diversity of plants and insects and so now you have way more species on land than in the ocean and their hypothesis is that it's all related with the amount of energy that can be gathered from the sun on land and this happened with probably one or two mutations that happened in, uh, in the way leaves are vascularized in uh, land plants. So I'm uh, uh, mentioning this example because Few, few events, I will talk about it, a lot about it uh, in the next lecture on Wednesday, but few events on, in, during the course of evolution of life on Earth have really changed a lot of, uh, a lot of the speciation biodiversity uh, on, uh, on our planet. So that's really uh, kind of interesting to, uh, to think about it in those, in those, uh, in those terms. I tend to think always about teeny tiny things and I very much admire people that can step back and have a big picture uh, view of things. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, if you are aware of the Gary Verme is probably the most respected malacologist in the world. He studies uh, shells and mollusks and he's blind. He became blind when he was three or four years old. And, uh, it's really, he has a beautiful book that I think is called Privileged Hands. If you have a chance to read that book, it's fantastic. And when he was a kid, they had to remove his eyes for the disease that he had. And uh, his teacher put him in the back of the classroom and she sort of felt that she wanted to help him out. And she had a collection of shells and so she gave him her collection of shells and all day long he would just touch those shells and became really good at identifying them. And then he applied to grad school at some point, and, uh, and they, the, the, his professor said, oh, you know, uh, let's go see the curator of uh, shells. So they went downstairs in the collection of shells, and uh, the curator said, oh, I'm really sorry, I cannot see you guys now, because I just dropped a drawer of shells, and I need to sort them. And Verme said, oh, let me help you out. And so in two minutes, he sorted all the shells, being blind, and the guy said, oh, actually, we were just testing you to see if you could do that. And he, he did it faster than any, any of the other grad students that they took in. So he has a lot of anecdotes like this that are really cool. Which is really, really cool. Really cool. Very good. So um, the reason why we have a poor understanding of uh, species diversity is for two main reasons. Groups are understudied and environments are poorly sampled. There's another thing that we don't have a very good grasp of, and it's the fact that there are cryptic species. Cryptic species are those species that are morphologically identical, but at the molecular level, you can tell they are different species. 
So when you look at them, uh, it's really impossible to tell them apart, but then you, you do the, the phylogenetic trees and you realize that uh, they are really different species. So there is a number of examples of that, such as uh, Trosilus and Gallo Provincialis mussels. In California, we have uh, two, shaft, two, two, uh, two mussels. One happens to be uh, Gallo's are introduced, but nevertheless, they look exactly the same. And, and so you have a number of examples of that. In the marine environment in particular, it looks like cryptic species are very common. But because they don't look different, people tend not to do DNA sequences of everything just to see if they are cryptic species or not. So it's difficult to determine how rampant the phenomenon is. It's likely to be common. So because people like names and stuff, you do not need to know those names. I'm just showing the next slide just for you to uh, realize that people uh, really like to put names on stuff. And so there are cosmopolitan species, cryptic species, and then exclusive, you name it. There is a low number of names. I know less than half of those things. If I'm interested in it, I can just Google it and then I figure out what the name is. It doesn't really matter. But it's interesting to know that people have a lot of names for these things. Things are not totally simple. Giraffes. For a long time, were thought to be one species. Now they've been separated into first subspecies, now real species. The alternative, the, 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 the contrast of that, which happens very rarely, but it does happen, is when species have been described. I'm sorry, when individuals have been described as different species, but in fact they are a single one. This is an example of three types that were described as three different species, but once they did the genetics, they realized that actually there were three different forms of the same species. This is really uncommon when you lump together individuals into a single species, but it does happen. During genetics, you, you do that. And so one larva, people didn't know what it was, and then they put it together with an adult. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, what is the like, line in like, the um, matching Uh, I will get to that in a short while, but uh, I have seen people fighting over that question. What I meant by that is not verbally. Uh, then, but I will address it. In, in a second you will see that. Can genetics help? These butterflies look a lot alike, but in fact these butterflies not only are different species, but they are even different genera. In this picture, there are eight species and five genera. So, um, when you do genetics, you uh, get to uh, get to it. So now, we're going, I'll address your question later, so don't worry about it, I will, I will definitely talk about it. Uh, we're going to talk about a number of different species concepts. The word concept in this case is equivalent to definition. So how do you define a species? In technical terms, we call it species concept. There is a number of them. Uh, I, I am going to mostly talk about three of them. And there are the three most commonly used. And I think that you should know them. What I mean by that is that it might be in the final. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I haven't written it yet. But one thing is for sure. When I say that, I think that there are important things, and so if you are interested in species, there are three things that you should know. The first one is the typological species concept. This was described by Linnaeus. Linnaeus was a Swedish botanist. He is represented here. There is some sort of an inside joke in this, because the plant that he's holding is called a Linnea plant. So, Linnaeus was a person that I like to uh, make fun of because I am not fond of that scientist at all. He personally murdered the father of ichthyology, Artigas, by paying people to drown him in Amsterdam. That's a long story. And also, that's a true story though, 
and he stole all his papers and published his, uh, his papers under his own name. <coughs> he was a thief and a uh, crook. He could be president. And then um, uh, another thing is, is that he was also quite lazy. Linnaeus is, is known for his big volumes called Systema Naturae, which in, uh, in uh, Latin is natural system. And these were books that would summarize all of life on Earth. And in one of the editions, I think the 14th edition, he came up with a thing that is called the binomial system of nomenclature. This is why we have a genus and a species, which is a great system. I really like it. For example, Homo sapiens, as an example. So you have a genus and a species. This is because not only was he a thief, but he was also lazy. And once he had a field class with his undergrads, and he passed out, and he told his, grad, his undergrads, go in this field and try to come up with a rational way of describing all the species that you're going to look at. And they came back, and they said, we should use the binomial system. And they came up with it, and he said, great, I'll publish that. Uh -huh. So uh, he's uh, credited for discovering the binomial system. But actually, it was his field class that did. The typological species concept. This is a concept that goes back to the philosophical idea of the Eidos, the Greek uh, idea that for each species there is an ideal representative. And so that's the type specimen. When you dis to this day, when you describe a species, a new species, you need to have what is called the holotype. That's the type specimen that you're going to put in a museum. You have a voucher specimen. This is the absolute best representative. So usually you collect a number of individuals. You look at all of them. You see the one that seems the, the best representative of that species. And then you put it in a jar. And the other ones are called the paratypes. So you have the holotype, which is the type specimen, and then the paratypes. That's the type specimen. And then the paratypes are the other ones. So, in general, you have in a jar, you have the holotype by itself. And then you have, if you collect 15 individuals, then 14 individuals would be in another jar. And then this is the jar of the paratypes. If you go to the California Academy of Sciences, as to be shown the collections, and then there will always be a row that is all the holotypes. You can just see all the one, the, the type that represents just a species. So the idea is really to have the best representative. Uh, in the last class, a person last year, someone said, who is the, the holotype for humans? Does anyone know who the holotype for humans is? I didn't know. I said, okay, someone just grew it right now, I have no idea. It is Linnaeus himself. <laughs> that says a lot. What is ironic is that his body is not in a jar. So actually, the humans are a, uh, a species with no holotype. And I was actually considering uh, taking another person and, uh, and re-describing humans. Actually, maybe we should do that one day. Maybe one of you guys, if you don't mind just jumping in a vat of alcohol. <laughs> we could do that. I mean, if you think about it, I, I think that I could think of Angelina Jolie, for example. And that is, both of them together. Two holotypes, that would be awesome. Anyway, for some reason, my ideas don't, uh, don't catch the imagination. Uh, a group of individuals that differ from other groups by possessing constant diagnostic characters. That's actually the original definition of, of Linnaeus. He considers that they are different than the others. That's it. Now, it's based on collecting and describing a type specimen for a given species. That's what I'm talking about, the type specimen. Now, I'm going to talk about three major uh, species concepts. 
I'm going to describe them first, and I also will describe what the what the caveats or the, the pitfalls of the methods are. All, all the concepts have pitfalls. Otherwise, I would just present one. I mean, this is what it is. All of them have. So problems with the typological species concept. First of all, because you consider a single holotype, and you, you want if you say, OK, the species needs to look like the holotype. Now, the problem is that if you don't look like the holotype, then you're not a species anymore. And so there are polymorphisms within populations. So in these uh, orchids, the flowers are different depending on the individual. <laughs> there are geographic variations among individuals. And there are sibling or cryptic species that look exactly the same, but they are genetically different. Of course, I cannot blame Linnaeus for not knowing that, but nowadays it is a problem. Because if, uh, if you look in the jar, it could look exactly like another one. But genetically, there would be two different species. So siblings are reproductively isolated groups that are morphologically indistinguishable. So that's, that's what I was talking about. So the typological species concept, as, as uh, you know, antiquated and problematic as it is, parts of it are still used because to this day, whenever you describe a new species, you still need to have in a jar a uh, a, a type specimen. You must have that. So, the second most you, I'm sorry, the second concept that I'm going to present, but by far the most used species concept that, that is prevalent in all, over, all over the world, is what is called the biological species concept. If you really only need to know one, you should know this one. This is a, my, my sort of cryptic way of saying, in the final, there will be a question about the BSC. I mean, it's a bit bad not to. The BSC has a ton of problems. It's marred with a lot of problems. However, even if it has a lot of problems, it's still very, very good. And it was pre presented by Theodosius Dobjansky and Ernst Meyer. I mean, it's a beautiful name. I love those names. So first, Ernst Meyer, who was a morphologist that worked on birds again, he says, okay, why is the BSC really cool? The BSC is very cool because when you describe what a species is, in the definition, you also explain why species exist. So the definition both describes the species and describes why the species are maintained as species. They are species or groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations that are reproductively isolated from other such groups. This means that they need to be able to interbreed and they cannot in interbreed with other individuals. So you have both the definition as well as the mechanism of why species are maintained. They cannot reproduce, so that's why species exist. So it's quite brilliant in a single sentence to have both the definition and the mechanism. It's really cool. Ernst Meyer was a morphologist. Theodosius Dobjansky was one of the earliest geneticists, population geneticists. He has a similar definition, but at the genetic level. So at the genetic level, he says the same thing. He says species are the largest and most inclusive reproductive community of sexual and cross-fertilizing individuals that share a common gene pool. That is exactly the same as before. Before, the person did not use the word gene, uh, Ernst Meyer, or sexual or cross-fertilizing, but essentially that's what it is. So the two of them say the same thing. So you have organisms, so you have organisms that are an, a reproductive entity and they cannot mate with other things. It's very likely that we cannot mate with chimps and so we are a different species than our closest relative to chimps. We can all, all humans can, re, uh, can uh, uh, reproduce with each other. 
So because of that, we are all the individuals are a single species. That's what it is. Hertzmeyer divided the biological species concept into two parts, non-dimensional and multidimensional, which nowadays people call sympatric and allopatric. You have the sympatric situation, which he did not believe exists. He did not think it was possible, but he raised it as a possibility. And now there is a lot of experimental evidence that actually does exist. I will talk about it a little bit later. So this is when the two species live in the same, <clears throat> the same place. It's called sympatric or synchronous, meaning that they reproduce at the same time. Or the multidimensional is allopathic. The two species are geographically in two different places and they are allopatric or allochronous means they are either separated in space, allopatric, or in time, allochronous. Or allochronous. I don't know how this how to say this. The other day I made a huge mistake. I listened to myself on those YouTube things. I have no idea how you guys can understand me. I could not understand myself. <laughs> and with this kind of accent, I would not be able to understand what I said. I, was, I mentioned it to, the, to my son this morning when we were driving. He said, Yeah, I know you are a nice man. <laughs> Made me feel real good. <laughs> if you want to feel real good about yourself, have to teenage kids. Okay. Um, one of my other professions records, like, he has like, some app on his laptop that records the screen. Yeah. And uh, now, uh, on campus, we can do that automatically. So I don't know if your if your professor does it on his own or on her own, or if she does it through the university. If she does it through the university, that's what I used to do when I taught on campus, and it was great. And we specifically asked to have this happen here, and they screwed up the electronics and they couldn't do it. Yeah. So maybe. The, what you're saying kind of intrigues me. If there is an app that I could install on my laptop that could do that, that would be way better. Because this is terrible. I could barely hear myself. And what I heard was not good. So it is not, it is not great. Uh, I'll look into it. We have two more lectures. I think, yeah, we really, I think that this last lecture on human evolution should be, you should end with like a firework and be everything perfect. I like it. I, I, I try because I really don't like the way it's, uh, it's coming up. Yeah? Do you actually uh, go over the slide? Again? This one? Yeah. Yeah, I will, the reason why I went fast is because I will go over it later again. But let me, uh, I'll, I'll just talk about it really quickly. And then again, I, will, I have a, like three or four slides later on about just this. How about if I do that and then you tell me, hey, you know what, you go again. Do that? Sorry, I'm always postponing your question, but, but I promise I'll get back to it. Uh, problem is the biological species concept. It is not applicable to asexual species. There is a large number of species that are asexual. Obviously, if the definition of BSC has to do with sex, then it doesn't work very well. Uh, Reproduction isolation is often incomplete, even in real species. We know that they are true species, however they can cross-hybridize. Hybridization is common in many groups. I mean, everything. Here I just give examples, but it's really anything. Uh, you have the false killer whale that mates with a dolphin, and you get a warfin. So you have these, uh, these animals, they are alive well, or the mule, for example. Or if you are a total idiot, you can cross uh, a, a liger, which is a lion and a tiger, and then you pause next to it, and this guy got eaten just a little bit after that. <laughs> or you can do the other cross, and you get a tiger. You know that there is a different word for, I can't remember the name now, but if you have a mother donkey and a, a, a father a horse, or the reverse, one is a mule, the other one is something else, I can't remember the name of it. You get animals that are quite different. Uh, Meyer's argument, uh, not argument, but he refined the BSC with two additional things that I did not mention and 
I would just say it in passing because it's relevant here. One is that the B in the BSC, he later said, not only do the animals need to be able, or plants need to be able to cross, but also the offspring need to look like the parents. And as you can see, these animals look gorgeous, but they don't look like either of the parents. And another thing that he mentions is that the animals need to be fertile. Most of those hybrids are not, because usually there are issues with chromosomes and they cannot be crossing over. There's a case of mules, for example. They, they cannot recombine the chromosomes, and so they are uh, sterile. But some situations, many of them, the, the offspring looks like one of the two parents, and, uh, and uh, they are fertile, many of them. So you have F2s and stuff like that. But in some cases, like the classic ones, they are sterile and they don't look the same as the parents. There is another uh, issue in the multi-dimensional multi-dimensional concept we mean the allopatric one it is difficult to verify what I mean by that is that before people were simply doing genetics people in order to determine if you have two different species they would actually cross them and that oftentimes is very difficult uh, there is a person uh, there is this person that uh, she did an experiment. So in California, we have a type of fish that spawns on the beach at night that is called the California granule. I don't know if any of you have ever seen those things. But there is a granule in Mexico. This is a multidimensional uh, situation because some are in the Sea of Cortez and others are in California. And her thesis, her entire thesis, PhD thesis, was to determine if it was the same species. So the only way to know if they are the same species is to interbreed them. And to interbreed them is extremely difficult because they only spawn for three months of the year at full moon in the, at night on the beach. And so she would collect them in San Diego at night and they spawn for three, three nights. So she would collect them in San Diego the eggs, then she would drive to Mexico all day long, uh, catch the spawn on the other side, find some male, fertilize the things, catch the eggs from the female from the other side, drive back to San Diego, cross them again. So she did that for three years in a row. On the third year, at last it worked, because it was always a problem after driving a crazy. And then she raised the babies to see if they looked like the parents. And then one night, one of the janitors saw the lights on in the aquarium room and turned off the lights, and they all died. This is just to say, it's just difficult to assess the potential to interbreed in multidimensional situations. As much as there are pitfalls on the method, the BSC is used a lot because it's simple, it's clear, everybody understands it, it's awesome, it's great. Ernst Meyer was fantastic, he was very fun as well. Uh, the third one that I want to talk about that is a very commonly used nowadays is what is called the phylogenetic species concept. The phylogenetic species concept, or PSC, was proposed first by Joe Krakraft, that is also a bird of paradise person, that's those birds that are here in front of him, and uh, the idea is relatively simple. You are going to use phylogenetic trees to determine what a species is. That seems pretty reasonable. I talked about it when we talked about phylogenies in general, where you're trying to put together organisms that have a common ancestor. So the idea is the smallest diagnosable monophyletic group of populations within which there is a parental pattern of ancestry and descent. In so many words, it means it's the smallest group of organisms that are evolutionarily related. It's the tree that I showed you when I said, these look like species to me. You know, you have those three groups. This would be three species defined by the phylogenetic species concept. I even didn't mention it at that time. But when you look at it, you just stand back and it's pretty obvious. So that's essentially the idea. I didn't mention it then, but that's what I was talking about was the PSC. 
Two recent extensions are the internal species cancer, the general species cancer. I did not mention it yet. I think that there are 56 different species concepts. Everybody have their pet one. The three, they all fall within those three major families. Typological species concept, uh, BSC, biological species concept, phylogenetic species concept. And after that you have a number of sophisticated ways of analyzing things. That's what it is. So essentially you do phylogenies and then in the phylogenies you have organisms that are closely related and they end up being called species. Now the problem of course is that how far down are you going to go to call it a species is a little bit addressed by the question that I got earlier about how much divergence are you willing to accept and I will get to that uh, in a little while as well. There are a number of discoveries thanks to the phylogenetic species concept. For example, there is a copepod, which is a zooplankton in the ocean, that is found worldwide. People thought it was the same species, it looked exactly the same. When you do a phylogeny, you realize that actually it ends up being a collection of different species. So the phylogenetic species concept can identify different species. Now, this is also fundamental in conservation biology because for, for those countries that need to protect species, then being able to identify things as species becomes crucial on a, on a law point of view, on a legal point of view. And so if you, if, you, if you go sample in a specific forest and you say, yes, this gorilla is a different species, then you can protect it differently than if it were the same as everywhere else. I've got two questions. One first. Oh, so is this like phylogenetic species concept assuming like DNA characters are being used or are we talking like morphological characteristics to build?